So I grew up in Singapore. Um, it is a very tiny country in Southeast Asia, but we are a very competitive group of people who is always striving to do um, to be the top of everything. <laughs> so, so that was me since young. I was brought up that way. There was a zeal in my heart that I have to always be on top of everything, be driven. I was valedictorian for my university, uh, and you know Singapore universities are like top 50 in the world. And, and because of that, I got into a really good job as well uh, in a Fortune 500, the biggest consumer goods uh, company in the world. Um, but even then, um, I felt like something was lacking. And initially, I thought that, okay, maybe it's just the company, maybe it's the industry, I'm just not made for business. Um, and so I decided to change, to uh, switch to military. So I joined the Navy in Singapore. And even then, I was striving so hard. I beat all the guys in my cohort. I got top. I was, um, I was sword of honor in officer school. I get to have the privilege to be um, sitting next to a senior minister who is equivalent to a president kind of level. Um, I was on the newspaper. My mom was so proud of me. My, my dad was telling his friends, like, you know, this is my daughter and all that kind of stuff. So yes, at that moment, I was happy. I brought honor to my family name. Um, and that, that was really important uh, to Singaporeans, yeah. That kind of lasted like two weeks. And then I was back to the question of, that's all? <laughs> like, you mean that's it? <laughs> and I don't think I ever figured out until I truly came to, after I gave birth to my baby and I had more time because I was on leave and uh, to really listen to the word and read the Bible. And then I came to realize that, hey, it was Jesus that I was missing. Like, I didn't know. I mean, I was a Christian at 19, but, but I was still very involved in the world. And um, so I thought that, you know, this Jesus thing can, you know, wait. <laughs> but little did I know that Jesus is the answer. That's the only thing that I needed. Because when I was here, I had no pay. I had no status. I had no nothing. You know, I had no job. <laughs> so, but the, funny thing, the funniest thing is when I put Jesus first, I was more joyful than anything or any time I ever had in my life. And now I can truly testify the power of God's Word. Yeah, because it's changed me from the inside out. Like the things that I see, the things I want, very different. It's a kind of contentment and joy and peace that transcends all my understanding that I ever knew in my life. So there I was, helpless, hopeless, nowhere to turn, nowhere to run. I was a scared little fifth grader at Longfellow Elementary School in Fargo, North Dakota. And standing in front of me was the biggest, meanest, and baddest bully. I'm going to call him Doug, because I'm sure he grew up into a fine, upstanding man. Doug, the bully, was standing in front of me. And behind him was what appeared to be the entire sixth grade. Doug was a sixth grader, and behind him was what I thought was the entire sixth grade. And Doug hissed in my face and said, You're dead, Stroud. What had I done to deserve such wrath, such hatred? Well, earlier in the day during school lunch recess, myself, a fifth grader, and a bunch of my fifth grade friends were playing football with Doug and his sixth grade friends. And one of my friends was carrying the ball, and he was running with the ball, and instead of Doug doing what every gentleman does, tackling him like a sportsman, Doug decided to run up behind him, and as my friend's running full speed, Doug kicks his leg, and you know what happens when you kick someone's leg and they're running full speed? It hooks on the other leg, and my friend went flying through the air 10 feet like Superman, landing and skidding across the pavement and the rocks. And as he landed, it was almost like I could hear his skin peeling off from his elbows and his knees. And then the cry of pain that came following that from my friend. 
And in that moment, I saw Doug do the unspeakable. He went over and stood over my friend, and he started mocking him and cackling at him like a hyena over its prey. And in that moment, something inside of me snapped. And I took my little 55-pound body, sinewed with muscle, and I ran as fast as I could, and I propelled my body, and I hit Doug the bully right in the midsection, knocking him backward off his feet like a laser-guided missile. And I ended up on top of Doug. And there he was on top. And how many of you have ever seen that movie Christmas Story? Do you remember when Ralphie loses it? Well, that's the picture. It wasn't a pretty picture. But in the melee, a teacher and the recess monitor come over and they break us up. And as they're breaking us up, Doug's saying, you're dead, Stroud. You're dead, Stroud. You wait till after school. You see, what I had just done, see, back when I was going to school, there was no middle school. The elementary school was kindergarten through sixth grade. And the sixth graders were the kings and the queens of the campus. And no one dared to challenge their rule. And what I had just done was I had challenged their champion. And for a moment, I had won. Well, we get sent back into our classes. And as you know, I knew what was going to happen because after school, I was going to have to face the bully. And this time, I didn't have the element of surprise. And so, one o'clock came, two o'clock came, three o'clock came, the bell rang. And being the brave, courageous fifth grader that you know I was, I went straight to my teacher and I said, Mrs. English, can I stay after school and help you in the classroom, maybe clean up some things? And she's like, oh, Sean, that's very nice. Of course you can. Well, by 4 o'clock, all those chores were done. So she said, hey, I've got to go now. So, Sean, you're going to have to go. So then I walked down the hall, and there was a custodian. And I said, hey, can I help at all? Can I help clean up in the lunchroom? Sure, you can help. Well, it didn't take very long. So by 4.30, he said, hey, I'm going to go. I've got to lock the building. So I had to step outside. And part of me was hoping that by 4.30, Doug and the gaggle of sixth graders would be gone. They would have forgotten. But as I stepped out under the steps, and I looked off in the distance, and there was Doug, and there was this gaggle of sixth graders standing on the sidewalk, blocking my way home. So as I walked across the schoolyard, I knew I was a dead man walking. No hope, no help in sight. And in the eyes of a fifth grader, I thought I was facing certain death. And if you were with us last week, that's where we left off. Not on the playground at Longfellow Elementary School, but we left off outside of the garden. In Genesis 3, if you remember, we have Adam and Eve had been banished from the garden because of their sin. And by extension, all of humanity then, that sin separates us from God. And we all face certain death, hopeless, helpless, with no hope in sight. And that's where we left off last week. And the only hope was that God somehow would restore that relationship with us, all of humanity. And so this week, as we move into week three of our three-word series, we've moved from in the garden, and this week, how is God going to solve that impossible problem that we all face our sin separates us from God. Nothing we do can cause us to be restored in our relationship with God. And so what was God's solution? Three words. God with us. 
God with us. And when we hear that word and we hear that phrase, you realize that phrase is only used one time in Scripture. And so I want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 18 through 23. So let's read, beginning in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. The one time we read that in Scripture, and it comes in probably one of the most familiar but yet most complex passages of Scripture. The the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, would come to earth, to humanity, and clothe himself in flesh, incarnate. We call it the incarnation. Incarnation. And Jesus didn't come He didn't come as a conquering king, did he? He came as a baby. Not most humble circumstances to the most humble of parents. Jesus. And you think about that, the name Jesus. In Hebrew, it's Yeshua. Yeshua, just the beautiful name, Yeshua. And it means the Lord is salvation. And that that name comes from the Hebrew verb Yasha. And do you know what yasha means? Yasha means to save, rescue, deliver. And I think that's Jesus, his mission statement was his name. Jesus came to save us from our sins, to rescue us from the enemy, and to deliver us from death. Jesus, Yeshua. And so we think about that phrase, God with us, What does it mean for us? And many of you are going, wait, Pastor Sean, isn't this a Christmas thing? Today's St. Patrick's Day. But here's the truth, church. It's not just a story from God's word that we should read at Christmas time. That's beautiful and that's powerful. But God with us should be a daily reminder to us. A daily reminder. And oh, we need reminders, don't we? We have reminders on our phones We have reminders that tell us what time to wake up in the morning. We have reminders to remind us to read our Bibles. We have reminders for all sorts of things. Why do we need those reminders, church? We will forget. If we don't have reminders, we'll forget. And so what I want to do today as we think about that phrase, God with us, I want to give you seven daily reminders each day of the week to be reminded of what God for us means for us for you and for me. And so beginning with the first is this, our first reminder. God with us reveals his plan for us. 1 Peter 1.20 says this, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Now we know that he there is referring to Jesus. And what this verse tells us, that God, who is eternal, we talked about that in week one, in the beginning, he looked across the eons of time. He looked across the ages of time, from Adam to the end of the world. And God could find no human being innocent. No one could live perfectly righteous. And so what we know this verse is, for that reason, and before the creation of the world, God planned for his son to solve the improbable problem of sin. 
God had a plan. And we see that. I want you to imagine, before time began, before the creation of the world, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, the Godhead, the triune God. And they ask, oh, who will go for us? Who will go for them? And Jesus, the Son, says, Father, I will go for them. Send me. Send me. A beautiful reminder. Before time began, God had a plan to send his son to deal with sin once and for all. A reminder number two. God with us shows his love for us. 1 John 4, 9 says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And so Shoreline, how do we show love as humans? With words, not just words, but actions. Actions. Let me give you a picture of what I mean. So last Saturday, not this yesterday, but last Saturday, I'm out in the backyard about midday. And I'm getting to that point now where I can kind of help and do a little bit of gardening. So I was picking some weeds and stuff right on flat ground. And I look up on the hill. And it's not a deep hill. Our yard's not that big, but it's, but it's pretty sloped. There's a steep slope, kind of like the worship center here. And I look up at the top, and there's this little peach tree with blossoms coming out. And all around the base are weeds coming up. And I look up there, and I'm trying to be a good student, and I'm trying to be a good patient to the doctor. So I realized I can't physically climb up there. I can't walk on uneven terrain because I'm still recovering from my total knee replacement a couple of months ago. And so I look up there, and my wife Amy's there, and I said something. I said, Amy, oh, I wish I could get to those weeds. Those weeds are going up. Well, she goes inside. About 10 minutes later, she comes out. And she walks off to the side, and guess what she does? She walks up the steps, and she goes and she starts picking the weeds. And what does that mean? What does that mean to me? She was expressing her love by her actions. Because for every weed she was picking, she was going, I love you, Sean. I love you, Sean. And here's what's key, Shoreline. She didn't even say a word. She was showing her love for me by her actions. Think about God the Father. He sent his son as a demonstration, the ultimate expression of love. He sent his son to die so that we could live. That's love. God showed it through his actions. Our third reminder is this. God with us provides the perfect representative for us. Hebrews 4.15 says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Yet he did not sin. And we're reminded in this verse of the Old Testament priesthood, specifically the high priest. And if you remember the high priest, their role and responsibility was to represent the people, to offer prayers and to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people, interceding on their behalf, both as a way for them to pay for their sins, to be forgiven for their sins, but also to be reconciled with God. But here's the problem. The sins, they were never ending. And the sacrifices, they were never enough. Never ending sin, never enough sacrifices. But Jesus, our high priest, fully God and fully man, Jesus came. And Jesus, in that full humanity, he experienced every aspect of what it means to be human. Every aspect. From the great joys, laughter, friendship, to pain, sorrow, sadness, and yes, betrayal. 
And Jesus fully experienced that. And what we know is Jesus also was exposed and tempted by sin. And the verse here says, in every way, like us, like us. But yet he did not sin. Jesus lived perfectly under God's laws and under his commands. In word, in thought, in deed. Jesus lived sinlessly, perfectly. And so unlike Adam, who was our imperfect representative, Jesus represented us perfectly in his life. And he offered himself on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for us to pay the price for those sins, our sin, every sin, past, present, and future. And Jesus on the cross paid for the price of sin once and for all. Once and for all, Jesus, our perfect representative, God with us, God with us also opens the path for us. We read in John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, notice that Jesus didn't say, I'm one way or one of many ways. What did Jesus say, church? He said, the way, exactly, the way, the one and only way. And I'm reminded as I was reading in Genesis, in Genesis 3, right after the Lord vanishes Adam and Eve from the garden because of their choice to reject his love. These verse, this verse, I want you just to listen. Genesis 3, the last verse in Genesis 3. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword, flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life, to guard the way. And this is a picture, of course, of God's presence and that Adam and Eve would be separated from God's presence. And there's no human way to enter back into God's presence unless you and the Father are one and you are on the inside church. Jesus was in the garden. Jesus' heart was broken by the sin. And Jesus knows the way back to restore that relationship. And so Jesus is the only way back for us to be reconciled with the Father. He is the perfect and only path for us to be reconciled to God. Our fifth reminder is this, God with us grants unlimited peace for us. Just that word peace, oh, in this crazy mixed up world we live in, we long for peace. We long for peace, don't we? And Jesus said this in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And so Jesus promises his peace. His peace in three words. First, it's the peace with God. We have peace with God. Because prior to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we are considered our sin creates conflict between us and God. And Jesus on the cross made a way possible for us to experience peace with God. So Jesus' peace is the peace with God. And we learn in this, vo- this verse also that it's the peace of God in a world that's filled with strife and conflict, fear and anxiety, and disease and death. Jesus says, oh, my peace I give to you. And his promises, as we place our faith in Jesus, what does he do? His spirit, the Holy Spirit, takes up residence in us. And his presence gives us peace. Why? Because Jesus is the eternal source of peace. God with us. We're reminded that we have peace 
in Jesus Christ. And when we place our faith in him, that's his promise, that he will give us peace. Sixth reminder is this. God with us reveals his willingness to fight for us. 1 John 3, 8 says this. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. We hit the pause button. We saw that, didn't we? In the garden. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And I think this is often overlooked in Jesus' mission. Is that Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. His influence, his impact his strongholds in our lives, his stranglehold over all of humanity, and Jesus came to destroy his work. And on the cross, and in the glory of his resurrection, he did that. And we know that Satan still is scheming against us. We know that. But his doom is set. And we know by the power and presence of Jesus Christ in our lives that we can recognize and discern when the enemy and where the enemy is scheming against us and our loved ones and our friends. Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. And our seventh reminder is this. God with us provides the only rescue for us. I'm reminded of this in Luke 19, verse 10. Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so Jesus here is referring to himself when he says Son of Man. That was his, most, his favorite way to re- refer to himself. And what Jesus is saying here is what? Church, he's saying, I came on a search and rescue mission. And the truth is this. Jesus came on the world's greatest search and rescue mission. And why did he do it, Shoreline? He did it out of love. He did it out of love for you and for me. Jesus, remember, he was sent in love and he came out of love for us. Jesus was sent on the greatest search and rescue mission knowing that we were helpless and we were hopeless and we had no way back home to the Father, that we were overmatched and overwhelmed by our enemy, that we were covered in our sin and we were facing certain death. Jesus willingly chose to come and rescue us. So you might be wondering at the back of your head, Sean, whatever happened to that bully story? Whatever happened? So there I was, standing in front of this bully, this pack of wolves. And all of a sudden, I hear this chant of fight, 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 fight. And then it went complete silence. And I had no idea what was happening. I looked to the back of this group of sixth graders, and all of a sudden in the back, these sixth graders just came apart, like just parted. It was like the Red Sea. And walking down the middle came, not Moses, but a kid named Scott, a force greater than the entire sixth grade combined. He was the meanest, baddest, and toughest seventh grader. And his last name was Stroud. And he was my brother. And he walks through, and Doug has no idea what's coming up behind him. It's completely silence. And my brother puts his hand on his shoulder, pushes him out of the way. He takes his hand, puts it on my shoulder, and he turns to the bully, and he says, don't mess with my brother. And there we walked, right down the middle. Not a word. And we walked out of the school grounds. And we got some way distance away, and I asked Scott, I said, Scott, how did you know to come for me? 
And he said this, when you didn't come home from school, mom sent me for you. Mom sent me for you. The love of a mother to send her oldest son to go find and rescue her second-born son. The love of a mother. But church, that is a beautiful and powerful story in my life. And you can tell it deeply affects me even today. But that story is nothing compared to the love of our Heavenly Father who sent his only son to rescue us to rescue us from the bullies of sin and death and the enemy. And he puts his arm around us and he says, walk with me, follow me. The love of our Father. And so as we've done each week, I want to spend a little time just asking three life-changing questions to just sit down and ask these questions and just really see where your heart's at today. Number one, do you see how God's actions reveal the love he has for you and his longing to be in the right relationship with you? Do you see that? Do you hear that in God's word? 1 John 4.10 says this, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, Jesus didn't come because we loved him. Jesus came because God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit loved us. That's what this verse reminds us. And one of the ways it helps me better grasp the meaning and the impact of this verse is I like to make it personal. Make it personal. This is love, not that I loved God, but that he loved me. He loved me. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for my sins. Church, that's his great love for each one of us. Question number two. Are you living with an awareness of his presence and his work on your behalf? Romans 8.34, we're reminded of this. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And the right hand of God is that Jesus has all authority and power. And what is he doing with that, that power? He's interceding for us. That's his love. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've come to the cross, you've confessed your sin, and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, just know this, church. He is interceding for you. For his glory and your ultimate good, my ultimate good, Jesus, he's protecting us, and he's helped guide us home to the Father. And I think about even before I became a Christian, God was still interceding. He intercedes at each one of us. Whether it was facing down and surviving Doug the bully or many other ways we'll talk about in sermons later, God intervenes on our behalf. And question number three is this. Is there an area in your life where fear is holding you back in your faith? you placed your faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit has taken up residence, but yet there's still this stronghold, this presence of fear in your life. I want you to let these words from Psalm 23 just fill your mind and flood over you. Psalm 23, verse four. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so even in the darkest valley, which is facing death, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we don't have to fear the deepest fear in everyone's hearts, the fear of death. 
I don't want you to think about my story. Think about me facing that bully. What changed in me? It was the presence of my brother. Where I went from the fear-filled fifth grader to the fearless brother. Walked home, safe and sound. And think about this church, our good shepherd Jesus. He's with us and he walks with us daily. So we don't have to live in fear because he is with us, amen? And so church, three words for us now. How can we live out these truths with greater awareness and boldness and confidence? How can we live these out? First, three words, embrace his love. Embrace his love. That means cling to, hold on tightly, For some of you, you're a follower of Jesus. You came in today and you're really having a hard time with something in your life. I don't know what that is, but God does. And maybe right now you're not feeling God's love, but in those moments, the deepest, darkest hours of our lives, we need to embrace his love and hold on to it. And some of you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you are honest, you say, yeah, I've kind of kept God at a distance maybe even stiff-arming God in a little bit of My encouragement today is to embrace his love, to open your arms, open your heart, and embrace his love, to receive his grace, and to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you've not yet made that, that faith commitment, there's no, we, at Shoreline Church, we don't pressure. We don't pressure anyone. That's an individual decision that you must make. And that's through the work of the Holy Spirit. But maybe today for the first time, you're feeling the Spirit's nudge and saying, oh, all these years, I believe that God hates me. And I've kept my... Sh- I mean, arms crossed or kept him at a distance. But today, the reality is he loves you. He loves you dearly. And his promise is he will change your life for eternity. Amen? So embrace his love. And the second way to live it out is this. Trust his promises. His promises, which we read all throughout his word, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, the end of his word. Trust his promises. He is faithful. We sang that song earlier. He will never fail. And so that should inspire us to want to trust him more. And one of his promises is he will never leave you nor forsake you. We place our faith in Jesus Christ. He is with us eternally. From the moment We surrender our life to Jesus throughout all of eternity. He is with us. He is with us. And the third way we can live it out is this. Share his story. Share his story. We know that if you're a follower of Jesus, you've been called. You've been called to Jesus. And you've made the decision to follow Jesus. But Jesus also commands us what? To share his story. To go and make disciples. The end of Matthew 28. Go and make disciples. And church, here's the truth. Every one of us, every one of us has someone in our life that has no hope. They're helpless. And that they can't figure out how to be reconciled with God. And they're walking in darkness. They're lost. But church, we have the answer. And the hope that they need is Jesus Christ, amen? And every one of us, if you are a follower of Jesus, we need to be more intentional about sharing God's story with them. His story, his great love, our problem, our sin, his solution, Jesus Christ, God with us and the importance of them to make that personal decision 
to follow Jesus Christ. We have the answer. As we think about the next couple of weeks, we've got an opportunity to actually invite people to church. And whether you invite them to lunch and share your story and share God's story, or you take the opportunity to say, hey, come to church with me. Easter Sunday is coming up. Come, and they will hear the story of God's love for them. Three words. In the beginning, in the garden, and today, God with us. This is God's story for you and for me. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you from the depths of our heart that you came for us, Jesus. As we're reminded before creation, before the world ever came to be, Jesus, that you already had chosen to come for us. And so, Jesus, today, thank you for that great reminder from your word that we are never alone, that you are with us, and that you are working for us. Jesus, we love you, and we pray that we would take these daily reminders with us this week and all the days of our lives. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you again. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Sean. Uh, well, Pastor Sean, you made it pretty clear that uh, Jesus has a passion for us. He has purpose for us, and he has grand provision for us as well, which I think it's a great way we can end our service this morning with those three words we started off with, praise the Lord. So uh, just a reminder, Pastor Sean mentioned this, in the Connection Center as you head out, there are bundles of these cards, the Easter and Good Friday invites. I, I encourage you and exhort you that you grab some of those and, and share them with friends, uh, co-workers, etc. Uh, today is a sending service. Once a quarter we do this, uh, usually right about the end of the Naval Postgraduate School quarter. Uh, we have uh, NPS students, families that are leaving us, but others as well that, uh, uh, especially this time of year, if in the next quarter you're heading off uh, to, uh, to college somewhere or some other life transition that has you leaving Shoreline in the Monterey Peninsula area, we just invite you to come on out to the pergola. I think there's a picture of it there. Um, if just come in and meet us there, we've got a coin to give you, a sending coin. And uh, we'd just love to know, uh, have a record of how can we be praying for you as you move on to what's next in your world. So please do uh, join us out there. Uh, uh, next, if uh, at the end of the service, uh, we'll have prayer warriors on both sides here. If there's something you want to be praying about, if this is a morning that you want to say yes to God's rescue plan, come and pray with those, those prayer partners up here. Uh, but they'd love to interact with you, and we invite you to do that. If you're watching online, uh, just uh, if you would uh, send an email to pray at shoreline.church, and we will connect with you and bring in prayer, prayer for those things that are in, of concern for you as well. If you're new today, a first-timer here, you've watching for the first time online, uh, we just invite you, all those online, to text WELCOME to 831-221-0290, and uh, you'll get a digital connection card there. If you're in the worship center or in family worship venue or out in the courtyard, come inside to the connection center. We'd love to know that you're here. Um, I, boy, I'm way over time on this, but I just got to tell you, I met a young DLI student here this morning. Of all things... He and I have some connections in the southern part of Georgia that just blew me away that God would allow us to connect like that. There may seem be some connection for you. First time this morning, we'd love to figure out what that is. Now, if you are able, would you stand and allow me to offer up a word of blessing as you go? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Blessings as you go this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, you brought me back to life. See, no longer I will live. No.